When a loud buzzing sound can be heard, we often think bee. It could be a honeybee, a bumblebee, a mason bee, a sweat bee, or even a wasp. But not all bees are created equal. There are nearly 20,000 known species in the world, with probably around 400 in Minnesota alone, differing widely in physical characteristics, pollination habits, behavior, and habitat. And although we can't be familiar with all of them, we can take a first step by considering two of the most common varieties, the bumblebee and the honeybee. Wander with us and discover the difference between these species and why it matters. Welcome to The Wandering Naturalist, a Three Rivers Park District podcast. I'm Angela, a wildlife biologist at Three Rivers Park District. And I'm Brandon, an interpretive naturalist for Three Rivers Park District. Three Rivers Park District manages over 27,000 acres of parklands in suburban Hennepin County and surrounding areas. Join us as we wander from park to park and discuss the stories of the past, the nature in our present, and how these have shaped our parks. Come explore with us, The Wandering Naturalist. So, Brandon, I have a question for you. Okay. You're probably going to know the answer, but maybe not. I, You know, you, I, I, you never know. I might be surprised. So I'm going to at least try because it'll okay. kick off this podcast discussion here. What does a cow okay. and a honeybee have in common? Ooh, ooh, I know the answer to this. <laughs> I figured. Yes. <laughs> we enjoy the bodily excretions of both of them. Yeah, I, that, I had to think about that. I thought maybe for a second you were saying honeybees make milk. No, no, they don't make milk, but they do make honey, and, you know, in some ways that's almost like bee throw up. So. Right. Hey. So you're on the right track. Okay. But I'm, so that's, I'm not, trying... that's not the total, do they both have legs? That is a common one I get, especially from the students when okay. I do presentations. But what I'm trying to get here is that they're both livestock. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I haven't really thought of them that right. way, but I guess that makes sense good. because, you no, know, we not at all. farm cows for their, um, for their milk. Correct. Um, and we do have beekeepers who raise bees so we can pollinate and we can get honey from them. Yeah, so they're recognized both by the USDA as livestock. Really? Yes. So honeybees are not native to the United States, and the colonies are bred and farmed like livestock, so like the cow. Mm -hmm. um, so what does it mean to not be native? I guess we should clarify that. Yeah, so that means that they were not in the United States prior to Christopher Columbus's time. Correct. So they're not from around these parts. No. Nope. Where do they actually come from? Honeybees are more recent settlers oh, uh, no. that European farmers I'm brought to America in the 1600s. So okay. Did it go? So ah. some of the first uh, European settlers then oh, brought them over on the ships when they settled in, in North America. Right. So now they've they've been over here and they've escaped. Uh, so we have them all, also out in the wild, not okay. just for our purposes for having honey and pollination services. We have several wild honeybee colonies right behind the Eastman Nature Center that we see yeah. in the summer. Yeah. Um, the swarms. Kind of, uh, we see swarms. We also see them coming in and out of trees, which is fun. That is, that, so. is a, that is a big spot. There's actually a tree at Richardson Nature Center called the bee tree. Really? And that's a hollowed out oak tree. It's a really pretty tree. So it's just kind of really cool. Every year you can go up to that tree and see the honeybees coming in and out. Is that kind of on their prairie? By yeah, the that's, in the, that's in the prairie loop. Okay. Oh, awesome. I might have to look for that tree sometime. Yeah. If you ask the naturalist, I'm sure they'll point you in the right direction if you come out to Richardson Nature Center. So then um, if honeybees are not native, why did Europeans take all the effort it must have taken to ship them for months over those boats? Like, I can't imagine it's easy having bees in a rough ocean. <laughs> You're trapped in a boat with them. You know, bees maybe get a little upset if their hive gets knocked over by waves. That had to be a difficult trip. Why do all that work? Yeah, I bet there's an interesting story somewhere. I haven't read much of the history of how they did it and how they brought them over. But now that you mention it, yeah, I bet there's some fascinating journal entries from <laughs> some people that got stuck near the, the hives um, as they came across. Yeah, captain's log. <laughs> exactly. Stung by bees again today. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so they were brought over for helping us uh, pollinate things like different crops. Um, and again, for the honey production, they mm -hmm. can be utilized. And no one really thought much about, um, you know, pollinators until really looking at honeybees, because in recent years, they've been having some issues. There's been some decline and something called CDC. Colony so, collapse disorder. There you go. The yeah. acronym for the podcast. Well, I know um, as of the time recording this, kind of 2019, we lost, uh, I think both, we've lost both of our honeybee hives that we take care of at Eastman the last several winters. And I think that last winter, about 
50% of the beehives just in Minneapolis um, didn't make it. And that's pretty huge loss. I mean, I can't imagine a farmer, you said that they're like cows. I can't imagine a farmer surviving if they lost 50% of their cows every single right. year. But this is happening to bees all across the country. Yeah, so really it was in the uh, two, like 2006 to 2007, I believe, is when they first started uh, seeing this colony collapse disorder. And in more recent years, we're finding it's not just that one thing. And as you a theme in our podcast, it's not just one thing, right? Right. When we talk about it's different increased issues. increased things, stresses, it causes spirals that these creatures just can't recover from. Yep, chain reaction. So in more recent years after... Uh, the generated concern of seeing these honeybees decline, it seems clear that there's no single factor alone. So there can be a lot of things, um, habitat loss, pesticide use, disease, pests, uh, again, just a lot of things working against these honeybees. Yeah, I think if it was just one thing, you know, they'd be strong enough to adapt to it. But like you said, it's a lot of things. Honeybees, you know, we think of them as being these nice hives and they stay there. But the truth is nowadays with commercial farming uh, that, you know, we need to have intensive farming to feed all of our people. Um, honeybees are shipped all across the country. Right. You know, you could have honeybees from California going up to North Dakota. They're and there should be these around. warehouses. So it's just like kids starting back to school the first day of school. You get all these kids who haven't seen each other together. You're going to have colds and viruses passed around. There's parasites that are transmitted. You mentioned pesticides. Um, that's not a sole factor, but neonicotinoid pesticides have... Uh, definitely been shown to weaken their immune system, which makes them more susceptible to this. Uh, so all these factors together are really having a, a bad impact. Yeah, on and these. you nailed it there with talking about them being like close together. So they have to have a lot of honeybees. It's not like they're just having one hive. So we're talking like overcrowding and then that movement. And we're not talking natural little small movements. I mean, there's Stacking them. North Dakota is huge. They're stacking them on a back of a truck together and moving them around because they got to follow that weather patterns. Because if this is your livelihood and how you make a living, right. you need to go where you can always be utilizing no, not the honeybees. All. So this time here in Minnesota, your honeybees aren't doing much. Right. And if that's if you're a bee farmer who that's really what you do, you want to move, move maybe to California where you can pollinate things down there or to Texas. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning, too, that this is not an issue just in the United States. This is an issue worldwide. Right. The European Union's trying to figure out how to deal with it. There are regions in China that have had so much pesticide and herbicide use, their honeybees are completely gone. And they actually have people hand pollinate their crops in regions of China. Um, that seems can, very time intense. <laughs> I, I think it is. They have a lot of people. They have them dressed up in these um, kind of oh, uh, no. special suits Come that back. I guess they don't contaminate the flowers. And they take a little Where feather brush and they brush ah. each flower on a fruit tree. I thought tree you were going to say they were dressed up as bees. Oh, I no. I was really hoping. No. no. Okay. Um, I think that would make the job more fun. But I think they're going more for practicality. Probably. Uh, we yeah. could probably put some pictures of that. Uh, or some stories about that on our Facebook page. But, you know, bees declining is a huge thing because without bees, where are we going to get a lot of our food? Yeah, so yeah. there's a lot of knowledge and about cattle, honeybees, livestock, the things that we yeah. manipulate yeah. and control. Uh, but what about their native counterparts? So think of a moose. How much do we know about moose? This is a hot topic in Minnesota especially. Uh, so think, you know, again, we don't know a lot. There's a lot of issues. And the same mm -hmm. thing goes for honeybees and then their counterparts of the native bees. Well, it's a lot harder to study if they don't stay in one place. A lot harder to study. So, and then the wild bees and these wild animals are unmanaged and live without our help necessarily. So this is why you're starting to see more research and articles in the news lately because we are starting to realize kind of that canary in the coal mine, the honeybees are showing us something is going on. And so now we have that question is, what is happening to our our native wild bees? Well, and I think recent research is showing too that we maybe rely on native bees for more crop pollination than we realize. Like when I think of crop pollination, like, oh, it's so nice of the honeybees to go out there and help me make my peppers and my tomatoes and my strawberries. Um, but it turns out each of those crops is actually pollinated by something else, not by a honeybee. Correct. And so you just said one of the magic words, tomatoes. Love tomatoes. Well, I like pizza, so that's what makes you like tomatoes. <laughs> you like pizza, you love tomatoes. Yep. So we got almost everyone on board there. And tomatoes are actually pollinated by bumblebees, a native bee. So this is kind of our segue of we've told the honeybee side of the story. Uh, let's talk some about some of these native wild counterparts. And I think a perfect example is the bumblebee. 
So what exactly is the difference between a, a honeybee and a bumblebee? Am I going to be able to tell it just by looking at them? Yes, there are some physical differences right off the bat. And one example I like to use is when you ask like a kid or anyone, an adult, draw a bee. Mm -hmm. You're not specifying because, again, there's how many different kinds. There's like 4,000 species of native bees in North America. So you could you have a lot of options. Well, but even when my daughter asked me to draw a bee, I draw a honeybee. Really? Yeah. Well, a lot of people will draw like the stripes. Yep. And then the fuzziness. Yeah. And that's actually a bumblebee. Okay. So bumblebees are much more robust, kind of rounder in appearance and, mm -hmm. and fuzzy. Just think very, very fuzzy. And even just watching them, they kind of have this way of uh, hopping from flower to flower and, and buzzing. They're just, they have a different flight to them than honeybees do. And honeybees often their legs are kind of dangling, and I just feel like if you watch, you're gonna you're gonna pick up on that difference between the two. I almost feel like honeybees are your average person, and bumblebees remind me of Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> that, they're kind of big; they look buff. They're a little bit bulkier. Mm -hmm. That that's a good way to put it. Yes, uh, I I just think they're super cute with that fuzziness. So the fuzziness is really what gets me, and you got that uh, yellow and and black color, but some of them can have some orange on them. Yes, which but, is beautiful. But there's some books out there. Highly recommend if you're curious to learn more on their appearance. Uh, we, that's a whole podcast plus more for identification. But just for your basic being able to tell the two apart, um, we'll leave it at that. So um, then why are they so fuzzy? Like why are they so much fuzzier than a uh, than a honeybee? Well, you can think of what they're doing in the winter. So we just kind of talked about that. The yeah. honeybees aren't really doing much. Uh, they're kind of trying to... They're staying warm. They're staying warm it's, inside the hive. It always amazes me how they do that. Like they form this ball around the queen and they can keep the center of that ball at 50 degrees, even if it's zero degrees outside, yes. which is incredible. And that's why they make honey. They eat honey during the winter it's to a fuel reserve. that heat process it's an, and it's like packing to keep their a, queen alive. It's packing away some granola bars for later, and they're mm -hmm. just going to use that uh, all winter to survive off of. Bumblebees, this is a difference. So bumblebees don't necessarily – they don't have a hive uh, together. The queens do hibernate in leaf litter or down into the ground. Uh, so they're hanging out under the snow. Uh, so that's one way to, I mean, they have, like we talked about with the frogs, an antifreeze type mm -hmm. solution in their blood. So they blood. kind of become beesicles. Beesicles, yes. And, and then the other thing too is they come out earlier. So think about in spring when things are the, like the willows, especially, I like to use an example, are blooming. The or first our pollinators. Spring ephemerals this, that we talked yes. about in our one podcast. And most likely, what you're going to see is bumblebees. And these are the queens, which I think is just the magic behind bumblebees and just gives you a greater appreciation is to know the life cycle of these bumblebees and how different they are than honeybees. That queen has to hibernate and survive the winter and emerge to start a colony all over again by herself. So she's doing all the work. She's getting nectar. She's building wax to lay her eggs in. She's feeding her babies as opposed to a honeybee right. where the queen has all that taken care of for her. Right. No, not at all. So she is just one charismatic, uh, you know, duty-filled, you know, queen that has to just really, you know, survive all these different things to take care of herself. Um and then start a colony over. So that, you mentioned the wax. So when we think of honeybees, we think of that neat, organized looking honeycomb with the hexagonal yep. shapes. Bumblebees, opposite. It's like a chaotic disaster is what you could kind of, <laughs> when you look at their colonies really? and how they form it. Yes, very all over the place. Um, they don't do that neat hexagonal oh, no. shape they're doing. She, they both can make wax. Mm -hmm. So that is something similar between okay. honeybees and bumblebees. But the but honeybees are a little bit more type A about it. <laughs> the bumblebees <laughs> range towards type yeah, C. Yeah, somebody will take care of it. It'll be used. Everything has a purpose kind of mentality. And it does. So, I mean, it's still everything serving a purpose, but it's just more rearranging the furniture all over the place. And there's no neat order to it. And they do build. Um, yeah. Pollen, and like they'll the build artery, little pots to hold the pollen and the nectar. And so again, Oof. that was the difference. They, what they, when they go out and collect and bring back, is just for them. They're not creating an excessive amount for us to be able to come back and harvest. Well, and really for them to use in the winter. Right. So they're not, they, they don't make honey because they're not going to be active in the winter, yep. so they don't have to eat what it. What they collect, they just bring back and 
really all they need that for is maybe enough for a few days of bad weather. Because yep. think if we get some really cold, rainy days. Then they can rely off their nectar and their pollen that they have stored up. Exactly. That makes sense. They're going to need something. Why waste the energy making honey if you don't need it? Yeah. So they're eating nectar and they're eating um, pollen then. How are they bringing these things? Like, do they bring it back in a similar way to honeybees? Good question. So this is something, again, that connects them because honeybees and bumblebees are, are cousins. Yeah. They're in the same family. So they have a lot in common as well as a lot of stuff not in common. But this is one of my favorite things about, uh, again, watching for queens and knowing you have a queen or a female bumblebee mm -hmm. is the way that they carry and store, store the pollen okay. to transport it. And so this is called the corbicula. The carbuncula? <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know bees had carbuncles. So, and we're going to feature this as our nature word of the podcast. Right, I think I need you to say it one more time. Corbicula. Corbicula. C-O-R-B-I-C-U-L-A. Hey, another Scrabble word. <laughs> another awesome a Scrabble word. So this is our nature word of the podcast, Corbicula. So this okay. is something that honeybees and bumblebees have in common, and it's how they store and transport the pollen. So when you see one flying, honeybee or bumblebee, you're going to see like a little yellow, and sometimes they can vary in color yeah, depending. Yeah, white, purple, red. It's the pollen, so it all depends on the flowers they're visiting. It looks visiting. like they've got like a nice little pretty leg accessory. Yeah, so it's on their hind legs, and it's just going to be, sometimes these can be really large in size, small in size, but that's where they're storing the pollen. And it's actually this very uh, kind of concave surface. Surface, um, with uh, outlined with some you know hairs. Okay. That's going to help hold it in. So that's where they're going to gather and store all, the, all their pollen to bring back. Okay, so it's I've always called it the like pollen pocket. Yeah. So another, it's essentially it's their pollen basket. But the uh, actual name is corbicula. Corbicula. And so it's okay. Latin. So corbis is Latin for basket. Ah. So there you go with the pollen basket. It's almost like scientists who made these names like Latin or something. I know. It's weird. Yeah. Some Something to do with Latin just connects it all. So then both honeybees and um, bumblebees are bringing back the pollen in this corbicula. How are they bringing back the nectar? So again, they have, this is the fun thing with bumblebees. They have really long tongues. Okay. So if you ever get a chance to watch one, they actually like flick out this tongue and mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot longer than I think most people would imagine because when you, it's just that's how they can get in into different types of flowers. And that's why it's so important for us to know things and, and, and research our wild pollinators because they do, they've evolved with our native plants here, our native flowers. And so a lot of these plants can only be pollinated by them because of this long tongue well, to get the like nectar. Bottled gentian. They're bumblebees are the only thing strong enough to actually get in and pollinate it. Honeybees could never that's, pollinate that. That's a perfect example. And that also brings another important difference. Um, so they have that corbicula <laughs> in common. But bumblebees do something really unique to them called buzz pollination. Okay. And so that's where essentially the bumblebee, like with the gentian, can go into that flower. Again, they're a little bit more robust and stronger. They're the Arnold Schwarzenegger of bees. The Arnold Schwarzeneggers <laughs> of uh, the bee world. And they're going right, to grab onto that flower and they buzz. No, not at shake. all. Okay. You tell them shaking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's very clear to me that you're shaking. Hopefully I'm the not listeners... sure it's as clear to the listeners. but Hopefully. So they go in there and they buzz pollinate. And that's why stuff like tomatoes, they need that buzz pollination that only bumblebees can do. Okay. So then I guess that leads to my next question. Why did we bring honeybees over? It seems like bumblebees are a much better pollinator. Is that true? I would agree that bumblebees are more efficient pollinators. Okay. More efficient. That doesn't mean better. Yeah. I think, again, there's, you've kind of got to fill some different niches here, especially okay. with a lot of the crops we've brought over aren't native plants. Oh, no. So they, bumblebees might not be as effective because they're too big to get into the flowers or they don't require the ah. buzz pollination. Right. And again, because we've been oh, talking is, about these I'm issues sure. with oh, honeybees, Bye. we're seeing those same things with Bye. our wild bee populations. Let's see what I got. So really, we're in a dire need of all the pollinators we, we can get. Um, so I, it, there's a balance there and, you know, you have a lot of people that yeah. enjoy honeybees and, and so I don't want to take anything away from that because I think they are very important. Honey yeah. production is Ooh. really important. It's delicious. You think of almonds and all the other things with orchards that need to be fulfilled with honeybees. Um, and it's really interesting too, because we haven't, we're just touching right now. We've just touched on bumblebees and honeybees. That's 2%. 
of the bee species in the world. That's amazing. 2%. Yeah. So we're missing a whole other category here that I'm not as experienced in, which is the solitary bees. Well, I think there's some effort right now uh, among different beekeepers and some universities to figure out how can we domesticate bumblebees and even some of these solitary bees because some solitary bees do an amazing job yep. pollinating almonds. And bumblebees do an amazing job with peppers and squashes. And so it, it seems like really what we want pollinated depends on – like what – each different kind of bee is going to be better at pollinating certain other things. There are things that a honeybee can pollinate that a bumblebee can't and vice versa. And I think the same is true maybe for these solitary bees too. Yeah, and a lot of it has to do with numbers too. So honeybees are, they're big. Well, you big. have like 55,000 yeah. bees in a hive in the middle of the summer. They're big. It's a bigger colony size. Most bumblebees. Uh, so that's a huge workforce. Their colony size is, you know, a few hundred. They could get up to a thousand, but I'd okay. say the average seems to be more in like the hundreds, whereas honeybees is thousands. I mean, a queen... A queen honeybee can lay 500 eggs a day. That's a lot of eggs. Yes. Well, and that's all she does. Yes, because she doesn't have to do anything, do anything else. else. And the bumblebee queen, she eventually gets there when she gets enough workers. She can just focus on uh, laying the eggs. Uh, so, and you, you you touched on this too. There, people do use commercial bumblebees and orchard bees for things like almonds, tomatoes, um, especially with bumblebees. And they think this is another reason, too, that we're seeing a decline. Just like the honeybees, the bumblebees are passing disease probably to their wild counterparts as well. Uh, essentially, they're used more in a greenhouse setting, but things mm -hmm. escape. Absolutely. Um, and again, they can be moved around. And orchard bees are used the same way. They can actually, so they set up uh, little straws because they're, they're solitary bees and they... It, a perfect example is to say like an orchard bee, she lays like something like 15 eggs a year. So again, to show you, like we That's can't... That's a huge difference. For the 500 amount, a day to 15 for the a amount, year. Yeah, for the amount of almonds we're all eating... Uh, the orchard bees aren't going to be enough. So that's when you have the honeybees come in to try to fill that in. So then it sounds like we need as many different kind of pollinators that we can all get um, because there's numbers issues, there's quality issues, different bees can pollinate different things. How is this applying to the park district? Because we tend to have more wildlands, but you've yeah. been studying bees in our park district a lot over the past couple years, haven't you? Yeah. So it was something new that I just got into. Okay. Um, I was really into dragonflies and kind of learned a lot about that. And I always like a new challenge. And so it was kind of this question of, uh, you know, the research going on. Well, what, what bees and pollinators do we have in the parks? And one of our guests today will be talking about a project that's been statewide and looking at the, the diversity of bees in Minnesota because there really wasn't much known. Mm -hmm. um, so what were the bees in our parks? And I focused in on bumblebees because, again, we have maybe like 20 in Minnesota. So that seemed a little bit it's more... A, it's a manageable number to That seemed to a little recognize. bit more approachable for learning different species. So I took some classes and training to learn identification, and we started doing some surveys here in the parks um, just to really see what do we have here. And it's been really amazing. We've, um, we're up to 15 different species That's awesome. of bumblebees. Um, we did confirm the rusty patch bumblebee, which That's is the federally, awesome. federally endangered uh, bumblebee, which is just crazy that it's taken us this long to have a pollinator federally listed. So it's a big deal. Um, so for us to confirm it, and I think we're up to eight parks that we've confirmed the rusty patch bumblebee right. to be present in. I know, I was super excited because no, last year we were like, we found the rusty patch bumblebee. <laughs> and so I ran out to where you had found it and I saw it too. And it was just so exciting because I'd never seen it before. It's an amazing experience. And there's a, a really good... Uh, shorter film out there called A Ghost in the Making. Mm -hmm. uh, go on YouTube and look it up. It's a fantastic film about the Rusty Patch Bumblebee. And essentially, we might not see this bumblebee in future years. Uh, it's It's been a dramatic decline. I think it's something down to like 8% of its range it remains in. Hmm. Um, so it's just... Yeah, there's some really shocking stuff going on. So we want to be able to uh, get some baseline data, which again... Is it too late to get some baseline information? Oh, but really monitor our bee better. populations and figure out what's in the park district. Where did it go? Yeah, ah. absolutely. Because then we can help care for them, make sure that we can do oh, things that help support their populations. And maybe Bye. figure out how our park district can play a role in helping with all these issues that are causing the decline of all these different bees. Yeah, so along with honeybees, our native bees are facing many issues and decline, which affects agriculture and the beauty of our diverse plant world. Yeah. So stay tuned and as we explore further with some guests who shed some light on the subject, from bee role on a working farm Ooh. to the history of beekeeping, and then again bringing in that research aspect across the state of bee diversity.
And we'd like to extend an invitation for all of you to join us on Saturday, September 21st for the 50th anniversary of the Restored Planted Prairies at Crowhassan Park Reserve. There will be horse-drawn wagon rides and so much more to celebrate 50 years of prairie restoration efforts. Brandon and I will be present at the event and leading our very own A Wandering Naturalist hike through the prairies. So again, make sure to visit threeriversparks.org for more details and you will need to register and we look forward to seeing you there.